Welcome to And the Podcast Goes To, a new podcast from ScreenCrush.com. I'm Aaron Whitney, Senior Editor with Screen Crush. And I'm Britt Hayes, Associate Editor with Screen Crush. And I'm Matt Singer. <laughs> I also work at Screen Crush. <laughs> he does. Sometimes. Most days. The year is coming to an end, which means the Oscars are only a couple months away. Will La La Land win Best Picture? Will Natalie Portman take home her second gold statue? And the podcast goes to, we'll take an in-depth look at the 2017 movie awards season from the Golden Globes to the Oscars and all the film critics circles and award ceremonies in between. In each episode, we'll discuss our top predictions, industry gossip, and who's most likely to take home the gold come Oscar night. The Screen Crush team has seen all the big movies in contention this year, and we have a pretty good idea of what's going to get nominated. On our first episode today, Matt and Britt and I are all going to discuss our Oscar predictions and what to look out for in the coming awards season. So let's start with Best Supporting Actress. Those that we picked for the nominations are Viola Davis in Fences, Greta Gerwig in 20th Century Women, Naomi Harris in Moonlight, Michelle Williams in Manchester by the Sea, and either Nicole Kidman in Lion or Janelle Monet in Hidden Figures. We're kind of caught on those two. I'm saying that Nicole Kidman is a little more likely, but Britt, you've said that Janelle Monet in Hidden Figures is more likely to get nominated. Yeah, I mean, fair warning. Like, I haven't seen Hidden Figures yet, but everything I'm hearing is that her performance is incredible and she really steals the whole movie. I'm hearing a lot more about Janelle Monet in general this year over Nicole Kidman. And that doesn't mean that, you know, Nicole Kidman won't get nominated, but I'm just thinking, like, of those two, if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to say Janelle Monet. And I'm kind of inclined to agree with you now. I have seen Hidden Figures and Lion, and I like Janelle Monet so much in Hidden Figures and Moonlight, so I just want to see her get nominated. But I think my choice, I, I just feel like the Academy is just going to be white and boring again and yeah. going to go with like the traditional pick. But I would really love to see Janelle Monet get in there. As a, as a, as a white and boring person myself, I, <laughs> why couldn't um, Janelle Monet be nominated for Moonlight? I thought she was great in Moonlight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Is Naomi Harris, is that the showier role because she had more scenes where she was kind of like screaming about being a drug addict and things like that? It's more sort of the stereotypical award that uh, role that gets nominated for awards. I guess it seems that way, that it's a little more dramatic. Yeah, I guess it's certainly flashier, I suppose. But Mm -hmm. I I love Janelle Monae in Moonlight. I I would definitely vote for her over Naomi. No no offense to Naomi Harris was good, too, but... Mm. That would be my pick. I haven't seen Lion or Hidden Figures yet, so I, it's hard for me to weigh in there. Viola Davis to me is the is the lockiest lock. Right. That's oh, yeah. the master lock. That's the uh, that's the super lock. And I think it's pretty smart that they're pushing her for supporting. I haven't seen Fences yet. I know you have Matt. But, yeah. Um, I mean, if she was going for Best Actress, she'd obviously be up against Natalie Portman, and yeah, yeah, people will talk about. Yeah, that's true. This is not as strong a category here as uh, as the Best Actress category. Um, with these options that you have listed here, definitely she seems not only like she's a lot to be nominated, she would seem to be far and away the front runner out of these choices, don't you think? I think so, yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Brett? Would you say that in Fences, Viola Davis swings for the fences? I would say that, but uh, I also love terrible puns, so. Exactly. <laughs> there will be an ad. There will be an award ad, I have to think, somewhere in some uh, some <laughs> trade paper that says... That exact quote with an exclamation point, and it's said non-ironically before the before the Oscar actual Oscars are given out. I have to think so. To me, the number two behind Viola Davis on this list is uh, Michelle Williams. I thought she was incredible. I agree. In Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, I think she was my first pick before any awards buzz was even starting around Fences. Was that Michelle Williams totally had this? I loved her most out of anyone in this list. Yeah, she did it. She she has a couple of I guess that's more that's like the like the Naomi Harris supporting actress role. It's like where you have like a couple of scenes and you have like one or two really big scenes where you scream and cry and everyone in the audience screams and cries and goes, oh, she should be nominated for supporting actress for this role. This right. is, She's very good. There's that scene in Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. there is that scene that she has the scene with Casey Affleck yeah. on the street. That's absolutely devastating. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. I think all of these women have scenes I haven't seen Lion, though, or Hidden Figures. But pretty much the rest of them all have scenes where they're screaming and crying, right? That's that's really true, yeah. There's that Greta Gerwig scene in 20th Century Women. There's a couple where she's, yeah. like, mm-hmm. throwing the chair and having a bit of a breakdown. Oh, she's so good. She's great in that, yeah. She's good always. I mean, Greta Gerwig is charmingly trying to figure out her life is my favorite subgenre of films. <laughs> like, just anything with her where she's just, like, a total mess and is just, like, really cute about it. 
I will watch it and love it. And for some reason, that just works so well in 20th Century Women, I think. Like, every other Greta Gerwig role, like, culminates up to this movie where you're just like, yes, this, this is it. That's she's, what I felt. She's really good in it. I wonder, though, is that it, do you really you guys really think she will I, like to me? I don't think it's impossible that your sort of your or pick Nicole Kidman or Janelle Monet. Like, I wouldn't shock me if both of them got nominated and Greta Gerwig got left on the outside looking in. Do we think that's possible? Mm. Definitely. Yeah, it could. I mean, it does. She does have some flashy moments in 20th Century Women, Greta Gerwig, but it it's not it's not as flashy as a Michelle Williams type role to That's me. That's true. It's more of the quiet suffering than the screaming in a Boston accent kind of suffering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, it's not quite as demonstrative, although it's quite excellent. I think that's a good movie and that's a very good performance. I also wonder if Al Fanning for the same movie could potentially split some of the votes there. I was wondering that too. I mean, Although that could happen, I guess if Janelle Monet is nominated for Hidden Figures, that wouldn't necessarily happen. But if she's, you know, if people are considering her for Moonlight, her and Naomi Harris could potentially split some votes that right. way as well. And out of all of these, I think Greta Gerwig's role is the most lighthearted out of any of them. So she might have those weepy moments, but everyone else has those like heart wrenching. Right. And that's definitely the lightest movie, too. Yes. Which might work against it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Because comedies are really easy to make, as I understand it. (laughs) Yeah. I do also wonder maybe if um, 20th Century Women doesn't end up having some weird sweep. I feel like that could happen with like Lion or 20th Century Women or Hidden Figures. I mean, there's a few films this year where I feel like it could kind of just kind of come out of left field and take over all of the categories. And I get a weird feeling watching 20th Century Women that like the Academy could watch this and go, holy crap. And the next thing you know, like Greta Gerwig and Elle Fanning are nominated and it's nominated for like 20 other things. Hmm. That would be great. I would be so behind that. I don't know if I see that happening, Britt. I'm sorry. I mean, they've surprised us before. I'm just saying, like, it could happen. Maybe. They don't tend to surprise us in positive ways, though. More negative (laughs) ways. Before we move on to the next category, the other person I thought could be a potential nominee is Octavia Spencer in Hidden Figures. And I think she has, Janelle Monae's role is a little bit bigger, but I think she does have her hand of really great moments in that. And I could easily see both Janelle Monae and Spencer nominated and maybe splitting that. I haven't seen Hidden Figures, so I'm going to... Oh, that's right, you have. Am I the only one that's seen it? Yeah. Oh. It has remained hidden from our eyes. (laughs) From our eye figures. Unfortunately, because it's it's great. I feel like it's the most, like, feel-good movie I've seen all year, almost. Which is really great right now. The feel-good movie of the year, exclamation point. That's another pull quote. Quote me. Does it swing for the fences? (laughs) It swings for the the sky. Oh. (laughs) Soars into the sky. Blasts off. Blasts off. Into the Oscars. Now we're cooking. (laughs) All right, so here are the uh, the the potential nominees for Best Supporting Actor. Mahershala Ali for Moonlight. Lucas Hedges for Manchester, Manchester by the Sea. <laughs> Liam Neeson for Silence. Michael Shannon for Nocturnal Animals. And then a, a, this is a, your toss-up, your fifth, you know, either or. You have Jeff Bridges for Hell or High Water or Adam Driver also for Silence. So you have two potential silences. A Moonlight, a Manchester, a Nocturnal, and a Hell or High Water. Britt, what do you mm-hmm. think? Who's the biggest lock for a nomination on that in that group? Ugh, you know, I guess I'm just going to have to go with, like, my gut of what I think is going to happen, which is Lucas Hedges, which would be well-deserved. He's really, really good. Mm-hmm. I would like to see, though, Mahershala Ali or Adam Driver, mostly because I have, like, a huge crush on Adam Driver, so him for everything. But... <laughs> Maybe also Michael Shannon in Nocturnal Animals. I don't know that as much as I really like Nocturnal Animals more than other people do, I also don't know that it's like the best Michael Shannon performance even of this year. I mean, it's really good. True. Like all of his stuff is always really good, but they I don't know if lot. it's like Oscar good. What what What's better than that one? I would even say that like Midnight Special might be better for Michael oh, Shannon. Oh, yeah, Midnight Special. I forgot that or came out this year. Or did you forget that that came out this year? I did, I did until you said it, 100%. I'm not going to pretend like I didn't. I totally forgot that that came out this year. What about his performance on that red carpet where he wore the, oh, uh, Hawaiian, he wore the Hawaiian shirt, shirt. And, and cut off jean shorts? Give him all the awards. That to, me, sure? that to me was an Oscar-worthy performance. <laughs> give him a special Oscar just for existing. Like every year that he exists, we just give him yeah. a special Oscar. I wasn't a huge fan of Nocturnal Animals, but he's he is really good in that movie, definitely. I think to me the biggest question mark for this category to me is it's like the moonlight factor in terms of it's not just – your, the potential nominee we've picked here, but the, the question of the main character in this movie, which is played by three different actors who kind of split the role equally. And so it's hard to give 
it's hard to even know how to categorize them. Like on my screener copy of Moonlight, which doesn't, you know, you can vote, I guess, for whoever you want, wherever you want. But when they say, you know, for your consideration and they list all the categories, they suggest two of the actors who play the main character in the supporting category. So they suggest if you're going to nominate Travante Rhodes, who plays the third and final sort of member of that triumvirate, they say he's a supporting actor, which I kind of agree. Like, I don't think any of the actors who play Black or Little Ho or whatever you want to call them, I don't think really any of them are a lead because they've only got a third of the movie. So they sort of suggest that if you're going to nominate them, you nominate them in the supporting category, which then makes you go, okay, well, whether they do or not, whether anyone vo votes for them or not, that's going to potentially split the vote for Moonlight in a bunch of different ways, and it could affect... Mahershala Ali, too, because while he's the most clear sort of obvious supporting actor pick, if people are going, you know, oh, I love Travante Rhodes, too, I want to, like, are they going to end up putting three or four guys from Moonlight from one film on their ballot? I think theoretically they could, but that could also, I, 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 I worry because I love Moonlight. I almost worry that we might not see anyone from that movie on, on this category because they're going to be like a three or four way split for votes for this category yeah. that's my concern that's that's i was wondering about that too i mean there's not really a lead character lead actor right there's a lead movie. character but there's he's played character. by three guys right. exactly yeah i mean i'd love to see Travante rhodes on this maybe even more than mahershala ali i mean i loved him but i feel like Travante rhodes just sort of brings all of the pieces together when you get to the final half of the mm -hmm. story but um if we were to pick one i would really hope that of anyone on this list, I would hope that Mahershali would be the main lock. But who was the other actor that's on that screener? Is it not Alex? Well, Kibbert, I think they had a bunch. The they had Andre Holland, who plays Kevin, the mm -hmm. final Kevin. Yeah, I feel like that's probably unlikely. Yeah, He's and then I think small. they also had Ashton Sanders, who plays who's Chiron, the teenage. the teenage, the middle version of that main character whose life is mm -hmm. is up there. He's so great too. He's great too. So I, I I'm pretty sure that they suggested they listed four guys: mm. the the second and third Chiron slash Black. Ashton Sanders and Travante Rhodes, and then Andre Holland, and then also Marshall Ali. Let's just so. nominate all of them and no one else. And then <laughs> right. you Moonlight could, has to you win. You could have four supporting actors for Moonlight in this category. I, I don't think it's going to happen, but I don't think they're necessarily like it wouldn't be the most. Uh, I wouldn't be like uh, outraged or offended to see any of them on there. They were all really good. So, but I, I do think they were kind of all supporting performances too, which mm -hmm. is the issue. I would agree 100% with Britt if there's like a lock. Because because of the whole Moonlight dilemma in, in this category, I would say that Lucas Hedges from Man Manchester is the lock of the group here. He's a lock. I mean, could I we bet though? A I bet a lobster dinner on him being a lock. Could we, though? If we're going to do special awards, then for this category, I would say special award to Andre Holland for just that shot of Kevin outside the diner smoking a cigarette. Yes. Oh, my God. Mm. Just... Like the sexiest, most amazing scene in anything I've seen this year. <laughs> I, I I'm I, I'm skeptical myself about the uh, the silence awards here. I mean, the Scorsese factor certainly makes you go, well, you know, he's got he's got the the juice to get people nominated. But I'm 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 not so sure. I, I certainly don't see both Adam Driver and Liam Neeson getting nominated. The one that I think. But it, it maybe is a long shot, but I actually think could happen and we pr would be pretty great because he was wonderful in that movie is Jeff Bridges for Hell or High Water. It is kind of a showy performance. It does strike me as the sort of best supporting actor uh, award, award uh, performance. The thing that the kind of thing that gets nominated, he's got an accent. He's kind of curmudgeonly. He's got a supporting role for sure, but he's also got a big part of the movie that he carries himself. He's got a whole his character has an arc. Uh, so I think that's not that unlikely. Like I would say, I think that's a, that's a, he's got a better shot to me than Michael Shannon. I think Michael Shannon is the, the longer of the long shots, even though I, I do think he's, it's possible. Pr frankly, if I had a vote though, besides the Moonlight guys and, the, and Lucas Hedges, I, I want to, I want to see Shia LaBeouf and American Honey in this category. Mm. Is it possible? Ooh. Is it possible? It's not. It's not. He's so good in that movie, and I'm not even the biggest fan of that movie, but he is tremendous in that yeah, movie. Yeah, he's, I think, my favorite part of that movie, but... Oh, yeah. And if anything, if I just want to see him do the, the Rihanna dance at the yes. Oscars. Now, I'm looking at the list of runners-up we have here, and you have Steven Henderson from Fences, who is great in that movie, too. Not, And that's not a super showy performance. It's, like, the opposite of, like, a Jeff Bridges thing, mm. but... 
um, that's a very, very good supporting performance. And I, I, I think if Fences, uh, you know, picks up a little of that momentum that I think Britt was talking about earlier about some, you know, people in the Academy just kind of falling in love with a movie and nominating people up and down and left and right. I think that's someone that might might uh, potentially surprise you with a nomination and not undeservingly so because he's really good too. Yeah, I feel like this category could take us by surprise. It's it's at, sort of at an uncertain place. But... Yeah, I, again, I, call, I don't know, the, the Moonlight Dilemma, the Moonlight Problem, the Moonlight Question, whatever it is, that movie it, I, to me makes this category one of the hardest to predict because mm-hmm. there's so many different ways it can go just with that movie that it sort of throws you off. And, and other than, like I said, other than Lucas Hedges, I feel like that, that there's one lock and four question marks here. Mm-hmm. So for Best Actress, our picks are Amy Adams in Arrival, Annette Benning in 20th Century Women, Ruth Nega in Loving, Natalie Portman in Jackie, and either the big toss-up, Emma Stone in La La Land or Isabel Huppert in Elle. So let's start with Aaron because you picked Emma Stone over Isabel Huppert. Right. And I picked Isabel Huppert. I mean, I would love to see Isabel Huppert personally, but I think that La La Land, that's what I expect to just sweep all these categories. And I think that Emma Stone is just sort of the go-to person that's going to be nominated from that movie. Um, if it's going to be a Best Picture nomination, Best Director, and Best Actor for Ryan Gosling, I, I'm pretty sure that Emma Stone's going to get it too for Best Actress. That's fair. I just think, I mean, I wasn't so certain about Isabel Huppert's chances, but then her winning the Gotham Award... I know that that doesn't necessarily have any bearing on the Oscars, but it did give me hope that like, oh, well, maybe, maybe people are paying a little bit more attention to this than I thought. So I'm going to stick with her. I think my, my number one pick in this category, though, as much as I love, I mean, like, I think Emma Stone's really great La La Land, but I don't think that's it. I mean, as much as I love Natalie Portman and Jackie, I really think like in my heart, Annette Benning will win. You think so? I think she's just that good. The whole time I was watching that movie, I was just like, oh, she's like, this This is it. Like, she's, this is like the best thing she's done in years. It's incredible. She's so good. She's funny. She's poignant. She's everything. She's great. But at the same time, like, I really, I, I guess it would be a toss up between her and Portman because Portman is also just like incredible. Like, my heart goes with Portman, but my gut goes with Benning. <laughs> I mean, everyone in this category is so good that I wouldn't protest if anyone won. Like, I, yeah. I would love to see Ruth Nega recognized. She's the best part of Loving to me, and I wish that she was getting more acclaim for that movie. And, you know, Amy Adams is wonderful and a rival. Uh, yeah, I would be pleased to see anyone. I think my number one pick personally is Natalie Portman, but I also think most likely to win is Natalie Portman just because, you know, this is just like such a, an oscar role, despite the fact that it's not very much of an oscar movie. Like, it's very much unlike most biopics that we see so it's kind of exciting to see it get this far in the race i almost feel like you could call jackie an oscar bait and switch (laughs) yeah because it has like all the elements of like it's a biopic it's historical it has all of those really nice costumes great acting but when you watch it it's like this is far from conventional right yeah, I don't have I, – I think you guys have kind of covered it all. I would say in terms of the the battle of Emma Stone versus Isabel Huppert, I would probably side with Aaron and say I think Emma Stone's a little more likely. But that might be my just my personal preference talking in that case. And then in terms of the I, the the category overall, I, I agree that it's – it seems to me that it's going to come down to Portman and Benning. I mean and Annette Benning has the advantage of having been nominated a bunch of times but never having won before. That might get her some sort of, you know, how that works sometimes with kind of a kind of a uh, lifetime achievement kind of bump in these categories. But then again, that doesn't always work. There have been recent examples we could mention where somebody looked likely because they were, you know, they had a longer career. They hadn't ever won. And it seemed like the uh, Academy might want to honor them just for that. And then everyone says that and expects that. And then the younger person who'd already won wins anyway. So I don't know that that's necessarily a guarantee. And I think that. Natalie Portman as Jackie definitely has more of those typically stereotypically showy Oscar-y moments. Annette Benning is amazing in 20th Century Women, but it, again, it's a comedy or at least a dramedy. It doesn't have quite as many of the kind of, you know, I can't envision her Oscar clip as I'm sitting here right now. Whereas Jackie, I could think of like two or three right off the top of my head that would work. And and that sometimes is like all it takes, uh, which is unfortunate. 
I think she might have some Oscar clips, though. I yeah. mean, she has a lot of those great monologues. She Right, but if you, you have to boil those monologues down to, like, 15 seconds with yeah. someone, like, having, like, a single tear coming down their cheek. And I'm not sure that she has those moments in that movie. And I say that, I and I say that saying, uh, if I had a vote, I might vote for Annette Bening. Like, she's incredible in that movie. But... I just, I don't, uh, this is where I'm always bad at the Oscars. It's like I try to get into the mindset of the quote unquote <laughs> typical Academy voter, and I'm almost always wrong, but I just feel like the typical Academy voter is going to vote for Natalie Portman and Jackie. Oh, I think so. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Portman beat Benning the last time she won? Oh, for, that's a good question. I, I think I, she, Black Swan beat her for, um, uh, gosh, what was she nominated for? Um, well, we'll look this up. That's what the internet is for. What did yeah. you want to say, Britt? Oh, I was just going to say, I disagree with her not having any clip scenes. There's that one really great scene where her son's reading her the poem, and her response to that, I think, could make for a really good clip. Uh, Aaron was correct. Uh, Natalie Portman, when she won for Black Swan, did defeat Annette Bening for The Kids Are All Right. Yeah, so, so this makes it even this more could, interesting. Oh, yes, that's true. It makes it, it the writing about it is even more fun because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be head-to-head again, and then, like, it could be the exact same outcome again. And then Annette Bening will, like, have to destroy Natalie Portman's life from behind the scenes, like a like a uh, angry puppet master. <laughs> the same way that Martin Scorsese destroyed Three Six Mafia. Yep, exactly. Just, <laughs> just like that. So for Best Actor, the nominations we have are Casey Affleck in Manchester by the Sea. I'm not going to attempt an accent because I will fail. Boo. <laughs> Joel Edgerton in Loving, Ryan Gosling in La La Land. Tom Hanks in Sully, and Denzel Washington in Fences. So the lock for me here, obviously, so far, is Casey Affleck, who just won um, at the National Board of Review. He was named Best Actor, and Manchester by the Sea swept that. And he just is pretty much seems to be the leading guy in this race right now. I mean, it's like a very oscar role. It's dramatic. It's heavy. Um, and I think it stands out as the most, you know, intense movie in this list um and if anything i guess we could see denzel washington pose some competition i haven't seen fences Seri- yet. I, I, yeah to me uh, having seen fences this is to me a two it's another two-person race kind of like best actress i mm-hmm. think it's, it's going to be between casey affleck and denzel washington mm-hmm. and i actually think it's going to be pretty tight because i agree with everything you said about casey affleck and his performance in manchester by the sea it's a very you know showy ro- role i say that thinking he gives a great performance but Denzel Washington's role in Fences is huge, too, and it's a great performance, and it's a big performance, a lot of dialogue, a lot of monologues, a lot of really intense scenes, him and Viola Davis, and and that movie is very small and intimate, and it's mostly acting. It's mostly watching these performances, and so he has almost the advantage of, I mean, and I feel like in other categories that might hurt Fences because you know, it's a very small movie. It's based on a play, and it definitely feels like it. And I don't say that as a as, as an insult either. I actually like the fact that it's very small and intimate and all of those sorts of things. But it really, I think, accentuates the acting. The acting! Like John Lovitz would have said. Um, and I think that's why it's going to be a tight race. And right now, that, to me, that this is, like, really... It's, like, too close to call. I feel like it's it's too early. I, I feel very confident saying one of the two of them will win, but I would be very uncertain right now to, like, make, like, a, a gambling bet to say it's definitely Casey Affleck or it's definitely Denzel Washington. I honestly don't know. I feel like at this point it's 50-50. Could be a coin flip. Do you think Fences can just possibly steal the acting categories and then Manchester would take up other ones? I would not be shocked if Fences wins a whole bunch of acting awards and the best picture of the year is Manchester by the Sea. Mm -hmm. That would definitely not surprise me in the slightest. I really agree that Casey Affleck, I think, and probably Denzel Washington too, I think Matt's right. I I do think that it comes down between the two of them. I was really impressed with Casey Affleck's performance in Manchester, more so than I think with anything he's done I mean, there's so much going on in his eyes and he's very quiet and, and it's one of those things where it says so much without saying much at all. I mean, like dialogue wise, like there's nobody explaining why he's acting the way he's acting. You just see it. Like, you know, you understand. And having recently watched Gone Baby Gone for the first time, I thought, oh yeah, I guess he's fine in this. But like in Manchester, he's like incredible. And I think it really just makes Manchester look even better. But I do want to talk, I guess I would like to see Ryan Gosling get nominated because I think he really deserves it for La La Land. He's really, really good. And I guess, yeah, everyone else, I'm just like, it's fine. I don't know. Best actor <laughs> is not my favorite category right now, really. It's just like, 
Joel Edgerton, okay, fine. Yeah, um, it's, it's not a, to me, it's like those two performances and then everybody else. It's not, yeah. and I, I mean, Ryan Gosling is great. I love La La Land, um, and Ryan Gosling is really good in that. But to me, it's like, I don't think there's anyone else who even at this point is a is a contender. Like, the other three people who are nominated in this category, it's going to be the ultimate, like, it's an honor just to be nominated. And I think they're even going to know right from day one like, I could campaign all I want. It ain't going to happen for me because it's going to be one of those other two guys. It's interesting that you point out how qu- how quiet, you know, Manchester by the Sea is and how, you know, Casey Affleck's performance is so interior and everything. You're absolutely right. And what's kind of going to be interesting is that Denzel Washington's performance is the exact opposite. It is so verbose and talky, and he has so many lines of dialogue. It's just him talking. I mean, his character is this very talkative guy. He loves to tell stories and spin yarns and— It'll be interesting to see what wins. I don't, again, like I said, I don't know, but it's like they're like two totally different kinds of acting. One is very interior and stoic, and the other one is so, it's so like kind of charismatic and boisterous. I don't necessarily know that the Academy historically has a preference. Maybe somebody could go through and look at the winners of different acting categories through the years and see if there's a pattern that can be drawn. I am not an expert. I don't know. But I'm very curious to see which winds up winning in this case because they are so different. I think even just watching the trailer for Fences, which I I saw in the theater before Allied maybe last week, and I think it was the first time I'd seen the trailer, and Denzel's performance is just like, like you just said, like the way you're describing it to me, having actually seen the movie, it is very talky. But I was more floored by by Viola Davis. Like, those scenes in the trailer, she's got like the snot and she's crying. I just saw like for your consideration bulbs just like flashing. See, she's all got an it. Oscar clip. There's her Oscar clip. She's got it down. It's in the trailer. They're just advertising that in the trailer. <laughs> no, she's very good too. They're both incredible. So I uh, yeah, it's gonna be that that to me, this category is both really interesting because those two are so close and so huge, and kind of not interesting because like all the other all the other nominees are gonna be kind of kind of boring or just not have a shot the other name we didn't mention that i feel like potentially could have a a shot here is adam driver for patterson which to me is also like a very kind of even though he doesn't have a ton of like he doesn't get the big speeches or monologues or anything it's a very uh, to me that's a really great performance and a movie where like the whole kind of like fences a little bit where the whole movie rests on the performance so if people see it and like that movie a lot i think he has a chance to kind of slip in as like the fifth guy maybe ahead of someone like joel edgerton potentially Mm. another one i was thinking of is if something like lion just sweeps maybe dev patel could end up getting a nomination here i had originally put him in supporting but i think i think he's more of a of a lead Mm -hmm. so that i don't think that's likely but if that movie ends up somehow sweeping last minute i mean again i i I think there could be movies where like you like we've said already like that uh if a movie catches fire with the kind of group Mm-hmm. This is where a category where they could sneak in because, like I said, I feel like after those top two, the the field's kind of open. Maybe probably Tom Hanks will get nominated too, but that still leaves two spots that I think are kind of up in the air, up for grabs. That a movie that if a movie catches on, uh, like a Lion or a Patterson or something, like a smaller movie could could show up here, which would be kind of cool. Mm-hmm. All right, we've covered all the acting categories. Let's move on to the the big one, the biggin. The best picture of the year. Now, there there can be up to 10 nominees, but we've got just five contenders here. So maybe all five of them will be nominated. Who knows? We've got, as our picks, Jackie, La La Land, Manchester by the Sea, Moonlight, and Silence. Silence. I'm going to ask you, Aaron, we, we've got five picks here. I think five of the, all five of them, very good chance to be nominated. But again, the category, these categ- now the best picture category can be quite big. It can be a lot larger than five. If there's a sixth movie that we don't have here that you think is going to make the cut, what would it be? That's tricky, and I want to say Fences because it has so much in the director and the acting categories already. Mm-hmm. So I could see that possibly slipping in here. Mm-hmm. Um, and this might be me just sort of being hopeful but i could see hidden figures maybe sneaking its way in if it makes way with janelle monet or octavia spencer um in the acting category so i think one of those two Mm -hmm. could maybe weasel its way through and i would be happy for to see hidden figures make it in there too i think i think both of those seem but i think fences in particular to me Mm -hmm. seems like the the one that i would add as like almost a definite sixth even though it is small like and i don't i wouldn't think it's going to win best picture I, at this point, it would be surprised to me if it did win, but I do think it'll probably be nominated. 
That would be my guess. What about you, Britt? You have a sixth movie? I think for my sixth pick, I I guess I'd have to say Fences is probably the thing that will like definitely get in there. I'd like to see Arrival, which is something that I really warmed up to even more. Like I really liked it the first time I saw it. Don't get me wrong. Like I really liked it. Of course I really liked it. I love Denis Villeneuve. Um, but I really loved it the second time I watched it because I went in without worrying about how other people were viewing it. Um, which is something that got me really hung up the first time was just the way that other people might be perceiving what was happening. So the second time around, it really got me and I was like sobbing and that whole thing. So, (laughs) and I think it's, you know, I mean, we're hearing this a lot right now, granted, but like, it's one of those things where in the context of our current political climate, it feels more important. And you can say that for almost like anything right now, like, oh, well, this movie is definitely important right now. Or now that Trump is president, you know, this movie reads much more negatively. But this is something I think that it's just a a good, emotional, positive movie that maybe could surprise everyone and sneak in there. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I just think it's the it's the sci fi movie that has more heart than most sci fi features, Mm -hmm. Um, more so than, you know. Interstellar maybe reads to people or, or even Gravity. I think this one sort of has that sort of warmth that I think the Academy could warm up to more so. So I would love to see that make it in there too. I I love that movie as well. I wonder if it's a little too cold and weird for, for the Academy. It's too cold? I mean, at times. It's very warm in the beginning, but it's, you know, it's like a weird sci-fi movie mm-hmm. that doesn't have... It has big emotional moments, but it doesn't have big like action or sci-fi moments. Right. And it's and and it's it's about like linguistics and weird symbols and that kind of like and trying to communicate. I agree with everything Britt said about how it feels more timely now than it did when it came out, even almost. But I just uh, I maybe this is my sort of cynicism and my lack of faith in the Academy Awards in general. But I, I like to me, it just seems like a movie that's a little too weird or obtruse or whatever for a, for a best picture nomination. I feel like it's more, we haven't talked about that category, but I feel like that's the kind of thing that gets nominated for like best screenplay. And that's, and it, that's supposed to be enough because, mm-hmm. Oh, I got a screenplay award. You should, you know, be happy about that. Um, another one that I could see maybe sneaking in here, if it gets enough uh, love would be like a, maybe I, I'm a long shot, but maybe like a 20th century women. It wouldn't shock me. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't shock me. Should we talk about before we have to wrap up though? Like, what out of that this group that we have here? Like, what do we think are the front runners at this point? Who is it going to be between? What are the legitimate, real contenders? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I think that it's between Manchester by the Sea or La La Land at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. I would love to see Moonlight. Hopefully, kind of steal it last minute. Mm-hmm. But um, I think Manchester by the Sea is sort of leading a lot of awards. It was named National Board of Review's Best Film of the Year. But then again, Moonlight was named um, the Gotham Awards Best Film of the Year. So that could steal some more stuff. But I also think that out of all of these, La La Land is the most feel-good, uplifting, joyful movie of this year that's being nominated, hopefully. And I I can just imagine the Academy needing something that's just sort of positive to end the year on and have this sort of like joyous note and let the La La Land backlash begin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just such what I'm waiting for. I mean, when it screened at TIFF and everyone loved it there, I was so skeptical because of the whole festival bubble. I was like, okay, everyone loves this movie. Watch, it's going to be just like fine. It's going to be fine. And so the, for the first hour, I was sort of testing it in my mind. Like, come on, movie, you know, get me. <laughs> and by like the last half hour, I was crying and I was happy and I thought it was just like one of the best things I'd seen all year. So... It's definitely good. I don't know if it, I mean, yeah, I guess I can imagine a scenario where it takes best picture. I think ultimately the only lock in my mind for anything, having not seen Fences yet is Manchester. Like I really see this being like, it. I mean, like in a way it's safe in a way it's not. Um, I think it has all the right components. I don't know. It just seems like something that would definitely, I mean, the silence nomination just seems like a given, but Manchester winning seems more realistic to me than anything else. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's this category to me is, I could see it going a few different ways. I could definitely see La La Land because it is sort of an uplifting, fun movie that I think a lot of people are going to like. It's probably the most mainstream of, of all of these choices. It's probably the one that's going to appeal to a a large audience. And and that's a consideration. It's also about Hollywood to some extent. It's also about music and art in general, but 
that component sometimes uh, lifts up a movie in the eyes of the Academy. You know, the Argo kind of factor might play there. Manchester by the Sea, I could definitely see. Although, one thing I'm wondering about is because that's kind of a, not only is it a smaller movie, it's also got sort of a, I mean, it's hard to call Amazon small, but it's an Amazon Studios movie, so it's a, a smaller distributor, or at least a distributor that has less experience in sort of the campaigning and all of that stuff, and is maybe considered an outsider in the Academy world, and that sometimes matters, um, whether it's a studio film or a true studio film or one of these old studios or whether it comes from somewhere else. Sometimes that can kind of play into things. And with Moonlight, I almost I, f- I feel like Moonlight is like kind of the, the dark horse here that might actually – wouldn't shock me if it kind of snuck in and, and actually won Best Picture, even though I do think it's probably the least likely of the three. If we've learned anything this year, like the least likely outcome doesn't always come true. And I, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I think it's a, a, sort of like La La Land, even though it's a, a you know, it's like a sadder film. It's it's not a feel good movie necessarily. In some ways it is. And I, it's a kind of movie that like I don't know a lot of people who don't like Moonlight. Like it's a movie that affects a lot of people. People have very strong reactions to it. Uh, almost stronger than La La Land, even though people love La La Land. It doesn't have quite the same emotional like heft that Moonlight does. So while I think it is, again, it, I don't think it's the most likely outcome, I wouldn't rule it out. To me, it's like a three-way race between those three. And if I had to say one is the front runner, I probably would say Manchester by the Sea, but I almost don't feel good saying it. Like, I almost want to, like, bet against my own instincts, which is dumb, but I'm a dumb person. So that would be where I, I, I stand on all that. I also wonder what the impact of two years of Oscar So White is going to be. And if the it Academy— could is... affect Moonlight positively. Yeah, it could. It could. I mean, who knows? It's, it's hard Those to Those other two choices are pretty white. They're very white. <laughs> and it's just amazing to me that even looking at this list, that a film like Moonlight is that we're talking about it as the third possible contender for Best Picture. I mean, it's it's a small movie, and it's there are no white actors, no white characters in this movie. It's about a queer black man. I mean, it's just amazing that it's gotten this far, so... And it's and it it's certainly not a massive success. It's not a blockbuster success, right. but it's doing very well in in sort of a limited release too. Like it's making a pretty good amount of money. It's one of the kind of happy success stories of the art house world of 2016, which is great too, and could help it in in that regard too. Because I do think the the Oscars do like to kind of back a hit. It doesn't have to be the biggest movie of the year, but I think they like to not only support movies and get them more attention, but also like kind of like. Um, give their imprimatur to something that audiences have already said that they like, you know, like, yes, this is a good movie, (laughs) something like that. And I could see that happening. So before we go, I just have one more quick question for everyone. If there's one film that you've seen and loved this year that would probably never get nominated for an Oscar, but that you would love to see nominated in any category, just a real left field movie pick, what would it be? Mm. I've got mine. All right. Well, go first, Aaron. Go ahead. Uh, the Lobster, for sure. That's oh, yeah. my. That was my favorite film of the year. Now I think Moonlight has topped that, so it's probably knocked down to number two. But don't you know? Take my word. I haven't finalized my best of list yet. But I think that's the one thing that I would love to see nominated, specifically Colin Farrell for Best Actor. I think that's maybe one of the most underappreciated performances this year. Um, probably because it came out so early, and because it's just such a weird movie. It's not an Oscar movie, and it's just so bizarre i don't think it's gonna get any nominations um but that if if it got any category i would be very pleased i mean i have movies that i love that i'm sure will not be nominated for anything and that's uh that's kind of a bummer the movie that i feel like might it might end i wouldn't be surprised if it got a couple of nominations but i feel like uh should be in contention for more and it's unfortunate is uh sing street like, I'm sure it'll, I don't, I'm sure. I think it will be nominated for, like, Best Original Song, something like that. But that's a movie that I love and I've seen several times now. And I I really enjoy it every single time I watch it. I've recommended it to so many people who all love it. Everyone, it's just like a movie that you can just share with people. And to me, it's something that could get, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe even a screenplay nomination, an editing nomination, um, maybe an acting uh, nomination for some of one or two of the of the supporting roles, which I thought were so wonderful. But I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the Weinstein Company, who I believe are the distributors, have sort of any interest in promoting it. Like I see them pushing 
other movies like The Founder and Gold, which you may not you may notice we have not mentioned at all on this podcast. When to me, like they have like a much better movie on their hands in Sing Street that they're kind of I don't want to say burying, but just not really giving a whole lot of love to that I think would be a much more legitimate contender for uh, some some awards and is a great movie and deserves oh to be seen by a wider audience but i think it's on netflix right now so just go watch it and you don't need to uh, you don't need the oscars to tell you it's good i'm saying it's good so sing street would be my pick or dirty grandpa definitely feels like (laughs) there's not enough attention on dirty grandpa i think it came out too early in the year if it was getting, you know, a November December release, it would have a little more, little more juice. But yeah, Zac Efron for best actor. Absolutely. Well, he was. I don't see again. It's like the Moonlight thing. It's like, is he a supporting? Is he a lead? It's so hard to say. But either way, it's it's being uh-huh. snubbed, and it and it hurts. It really hurts. I forgot that that movie even came out this year. I think for me, there's a few things that I would love. You know, in my ideal world. It would be amazing to see something like High Rise get nominated or like. Oh, Neo- get out of here. Come <laughs> yeah. on. Even get nominated for like best score, which really does have an incredible score, no matter what you feel about the movie. But ultimately, my pick is The Handmaiden. Oh, yes. Ah, I'm behind okay. that. Okay. All right. You redeemed yourself there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I just, I think that like there's so many things that you could easily nominate it for. I know the Academy can be a little. Um, shy about foreign language stuff um, in the general body of awards. But I mean, like the costumes are incredible. There's so many like technical awards you could give that movie. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets at least nominated for best foreign language film, but uh, I'd like to see it in just like the proper categories, best picture, best cinematography, best directing. Like it's the best thing Park Chan-wook has ever done. I think it's just an amazing accomplishment. And it's so joyful. So if we're talking about joyful films like La La Land, she nominated a joyful film like The Handmaiden. I'm pretty sure, actually. They're about the same in terms of joyfulness. Sure, absolutely. I'm pretty sure that South Korea submitted a different film, though. Uh, So I don't think it even has a shot at at Best Foreign Film. Not to be a damper, but I'm going to look it up right now. I need to write a letter to South Korea. (laughs) What did they submit instead? Dirty Grandpa, weirdly enough. The Age of Shadows. Mm. Oh, really? Good title, uh-huh. at least. Oh, the Ji Won Kim film. I still haven't seen that. I really liked his last film, which was, uh, well, or not his last film. I don't know if I Saw the Devil was his last film, but I really loved I Saw the Devil. So I don't know. I hear Age of Shadows is good, but better than The Handmaiden. Nothing's better than The Handmaiden. Come on. <laughs> yeah, you did give it a 10 out of 10. So in hindsight, by the way, Matt, like initially I gave High Rise an 8 after I first watched it, but when I saw it a second time, in the same week, no don't less. Do, don't say it. Don't do it. I get, in, in, retroactively, I give it a 10. <sighs> oh, no. I know. But it's so good. <sighs> you know that Simpsons where you see Ralph Wiggum's, like, face, like, and they, like, go through a frame at a time and watch his, like, heart break when Lisa says she doesn't want to choo-choo-choose him? That's how yeah. I feel. That's how I feel right now. <laughs> Just hearing you say these things about it's a 10 out of 10, it, it breaks my heart. So. <laughs> You can catch new episodes of And the Podcast Goes to every other Wednesday. Our next episode will air on December 14th, and it's going to be all about the Golden Globes nominations, which will come out earlier that week. So be sure to subscribe on iTunes and follow us on our YouTube channel to listen to the latest episodes. For more of the latest movie and TV news, head to ScreenCrush.com. Follow us on Twitter at Screen Crush News, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram and Snapchat at the username ScreenCrush. Crush.